Good morning. Uh, this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We are meeting yet again. It is Thursday, February 17th. We will start our meeting with a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Messner. Here. Commissioner Bogue. Not here. Commissioner Hackett. Not here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. All right. We got five out of seven. That is a quorum. We are entitled to do business. We are taking up docket number 21060097, the financial assurance rulemaking. Um, with that, um, <clears throat> We did have a late breaking development in the rulemaking um, either last night or this morning. I'm not sure. I'm still on my first cup of coffee. Uh, we did receive a motion and um, I would like to call upon AAG Davenport to talk to us about the motion and uh, its merits and help us uh, work through that issue ahead of party presentations, which is set for today. AAG Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I had an opportunity to review the motion that was filed, at least in, based on my view, the motion makes two arguments. One, that the voluntary relinquishment rule is not within the scope of this rulemaking and therefore the commission cannot consider it without re-noticing the rulemaking or taking other procedural action. And two, that the commission should not adopt the voluntary relinquishment rule based on its merits. Um, I'll provide my view on the first argument, but, but not the second. Um, in my view, voluntary relinquishment is a logical outgrowth of the noticed rulemaking that's based on a couple, my view is based on a couple of things. First of all, the noticed rulemaking was broad in the sense that it broadly discussed and noticed rulemaking for all financial assurance rules, 700 series and related rules. Um, I don't think there's, it's been any, uh, certainly not been a secret that one of the most important purposes of this rulemaking is to address orphaned wells. And many provisions of the rules are intended, the draft rules are intended to do that. Um, the voluntary relinquishment in my view is directly related to that purpose. And finally, I think it has been discussed in the course of at least party presentations earlier in this hearing. Uh, therefore, I do believe it's a logical outgrowth. The logical outgrowth doctrine is a doctrine that provides that if um, a proposed rule could have been reasonably considered or understood to be an outgrowth of the originally noticed rulemaking, that it can be considered by the agency and adopted by the agency if it so chooses. Um, it's sort of a, it's a review of certainly the proposed rules, but also the notice and could it be fairly considered to be within the noticed rulemaking. Uh, I think that it is here, as I said, I think the commission can consider it, though uh, this is solely a question right now of whether you can even consider it, not a question of whether or not you should adopt voluntary relinquishment in one form or another. Okay, thank you very much, AAG Davenport. Um, commissioners, we have this uh, pending motion. Um, we now have heard from our AAG with regard to uh, the merits as to whether the voluntary relinquishment is within the scope. We've been advised that it is. Uh, I, I think we can all just sort of speak to our own thoughts about it. Um, I want to try to, you know, figure this out. We're about to go into two days worth of hearing from parties. And so I think it's important to understand <clears throat> this and whether the majority of the commission thinks this, this issue is within the scope, not whether we're gonna do it or not, but just whether it's worthy of consideration. I for one think it is. Uh, I agree with A.G. Davenport that it is um, uh, within the scope of the consideration for the commission that it's a natural outgrowth to all the things that we've been discussing. I think we've been discussing it for a period of time. 
Um, and my idea would be that, uh, you know, if folks want to talk about it, go for it over the course of the next two days. And then we'll debate the merits of it uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday. Do other commissioners have thoughts or considerations around these lines so that we can inform parties of where we sort of are sitting? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I agree with everything that's been said thus far. And as part of the mission also to um, try to determine which operators are um, capable of um, financial, financial health and being able to take care of their wells. I think this is part of that discussion and a part of the goal of Senate Bill 181. I feel like, and I'd have to go back and look at who submitted the testimony, but related to AAG Dan for its comment, I do believe that someone submitted it as part of their maybe written testimony for the commission to consider. So I don't feel like it's something new and I feel like we've been talking about it for a while and I think it fits in with all the discussions about all the tools for us to use to figure out how we figure out the financial health of the wells, the financial health of operators and create a more robust financial assurance program. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I mean, at this stage, I don't have an opinion on whether it's a good idea or not a good idea, um, but it certainly has been part of the discussions. It was, um, in my mind, it was initially initiated by Wild Earth Guardians with their WAP program. Um, I think it's interesting that they're choosing to um, uh, file this motion, but I think uh, uh, the, the conceptually, it's something that's been discussed for uh, quite a while now through this rulemaking process. And so certainly I think it's appropriate to continue to um, hear testimony on it and to discuss it, so. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Commissioner Najapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't really have much to add. I, you know, I agree with everything that, that's been said. I think it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's relevant and appropriate for us to consider and, and um, that's where I stand. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yep, agreed um, on to, to, to a lot of that. Yeah, relevant and appropriate. Um, and, and not only did it come out of, you know, kind of our discussions, but it also came out of, you know, our direction, um, or at least, you know, some commissioners direction towards staff in terms of how we were trying to dial in this next iteration. And I feel that's well within our ability to do and, um, and is a natural part of, of our myriad of options that we're considering for financial assurance. So I'm comfortable moving forward with with it at least being part of the discussion. Okay, so I think there is a uh, unanimous consent with regard to the fact that we're not making a decision as to the merits of the issue, but we are making a decision that it's on the table. Um, is that fair? Yes, and Mr. Chair, there was a comment, yes. Ms. Merlin, and I did read her motion this morning. It was submitted into the e-filing system. Very good. Uh, and I too took a quick look through it as well. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> having dealt with that, we now will proceed with what was Mr. Chair. Yes. Mr. I apologize for interrupting. I think to just button this up, I'd suggest a formal motion from the commission denying the motion to the extent that it requests uh, or a determination that the voluntary relinquishment is outside the scope. Very good. Uh, does anyone want to make said motion? <clears throat> uh, I'll make a motion to deny uh, the motion. It was a motion to leave, wasn't it, AAG Davenport? Well, yes, there was kind of another, there was a request that the commission consider the motion. It's been our practice to not allow motions unless there's sort of a formal acceptance of it, I think that that moment has probably passed at this point. Um, and so I think the decision before you and the motion as I understand it from Commissioner Messner is to deny Wild Earth Guardian's motion to the extent that it requests the commission determine that voluntary relinquishment is outside the scope. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second as articulated by AAG Davenport. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Does that uh, tidy up our record there, AG Davenport? It does. Thank you, commissioners. No, thank you. 
Okay, <clears throat> getting back to what was agendized for us this morning, uh, we are taking up docket number 21060097, financial assurance rulemakings. We have party presentations. Um, we have allocated timelines for party presentations. And we will start with the Colorado Oil and Gas Association, who have been allocated 30 minutes. I see uh, Ms. Ryan and Mr. Matthews. Good morning to you both. Um, do you have anyone else that you would like to be? Oh, I also see Mr. Kuklisher, Mr. McDonald. Help me out if we need more. We are all assembled. Thank you. Okay, very good. And as is our normal um, uh, approach, uh, and I think we have Ms. Larson back with us. I think she got booted off the internet there during roll call. Uh, there she is. She's back. Yay. Um, you'll be taking care of time for us. I will. And uh, Koga has 33 minutes. 33 minutes. Okay. You missed an elegant and enticing roll call, Ms. Larson. <laughs> You're going to take my job over before I know it. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Ryan, I believe you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, staff, and other parties. I'm Julia Ryan with Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek on behalf of the Colorado Oil and Gas Association. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you once more. Uh, Mr. McDonald, could you please begin the slide deck? Okay, Kogan and his members thank you and commission staff for their continued efforts in this challenging rulemaking. Colorado is lucky to have such dedicated public servants. I will be kicking things off and then I will turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Matthews. Chris Kolklisher will follow Mr. Matthews. And then at the very end, I will, re will return to request a few final modifications to staff's latest draft rules. Next slide, please. I'm starting with the two words that best describe the outcome of this rulemaking, paradigm shift. Commissioners, there can be no doubt that the rules that you are adopting will result in the state of Colorado having a comprehensive multi-pronged repertoire of resources addressing financial assurance and related issues such as orphan wells. Under the new rules, operators will be submitting significantly more financial assurance as compared to the amount of financial assurance they hold today. Not only will financial assurance for inactive wells greatly increase, but the financial assurance for active wells will also be greatly enhanced. And not only will operators pursuing options three and four be paying single well financial assurance for all of their wells, including inactive wells, but also operators pursuing options one and two will also have the vast majority of their inactive wells covered by single well financial assurance. In addition to increased financial assurance amounts, the commission for the first time will have a dedicated orphan well program annual well registration fee. This plus the federal funding makes the state well positioned to address orphan wells and the state will have tens of millions of dollars for this purpose. Under the new rules, operators will also be required for the first time to submit financial assurance plans containing a variety of key information. This includes operators submitting information regarding their asset retirement plans. Operators will be required to provide a demonstration of how they are planning for the retirement of their oil and gas operations based on projected life of the field, age of the infrastructure, out of service and active and low producing wells and related information. Moreover, an operator's financial health gets an, an annual physical and annual health checkup through the director's annual review of financial assurance plans. Another critical component of the new rules is the out of service well framework, which will lead to the plugging of uneconomic wells. And commissioners, when I was preparing for today and thinking about just how, what a paradigm shift this is, one of the things that struck me is when you look at the existing 700 series rules, they're four pages long, four pages. Staff's financial assurance rules, their draft are 24 pages long. And that excludes the out-of-service framework, all of the new definitions, and the corresponding additions to the 200 and 500 series rules. 
Overall, the new rules will add 48 pages of regulations to Colorado's rule book. It cannot be reasonably disputed that we are facing a paradigm shift with these new rules. Mr. Matthews will now discuss the option structure in more detail. Good morning, commissioners. As Ms. Ryan indicated, I'll be addressing the option structure for determining financial assurance. Mr. Colclay-Sher will then speak about the AVO requirement, and then I will be addressing single well financial assurance in the recently issued draft rules. COGA endorses the option structure <clears throat> in the draft rules. It's a creative and comprehensive effort that we believe does a good job of tailoring financial assurance to the financial risk of every operator in the state. It requires financially and operationally strong operators to either pay a comprehensive all-inclusive bond at the highest amount of what the states require or pay for a blanket bond for their active wells <clears throat> and single well financial assurance for nearly all of their inactive wells. And importantly, the tier structure targets those operators who are not financially and operationally strong by requiring the highest levels of financial assurance for wells in their possession. Because there are so many different operator profiles in the state, this kind of multi-option approach is absolutely necessary. You will, over the next couple of days, hear parties inveigh against the use of blanket bonding and the need for much broader use of single well financial assurance. But this option structure in the draft rules already requires single well financial assurance in many circumstances, as Ms. Ryan indicated. Operators with the strongest finances will still have to pay single well financial assurance for 90% of their inactive wells. <clears throat> and operators with weaker financials will of course have to pay single well financial assurance for all of their well fleet, whether active or inactive. It's simply inaccurate to state that this option structure does not extensively employ single well financial assurance. I think it's also inaccurate to suggest, as a number of parties will, that this option structure is not a paradigm shift. <clears throat> the draft rules impose extremely high blanket bonding amounts, require single well financial assurance for nearly all inactive wells, and impose a robust fee registration payment to further bolster the orphan well fund. And those operators who opt for a comprehensive bond will be paying a sum as high as any state requires. And this rulemaking is also a paradigm shift because the amount of financial assurance operators will be paying under these rules will be significantly higher than the amounts required under the current financial assurance regulations. Indeed, the operators <clears throat> that we have discussed this issue with anticipate paying under the new rules anywhere from three to six times or even more the amount of financial assurance they're required to have now. This huge increase in financial assurance represents a fundamental change in the way this commission views and applies financial assurance requirements. Please uh, advance the slide, Mr. McDonald. While the option structure and the rules work well, COGA does suggest a few modifications. First, we believe you shouldn't have a heightened standard for those operators who wish to have the commission arrive at a tailor or bespoke financial assurance plan. A number of you have spoken at length about the need to encourage creative solutions to financial assurance and the need to give operators options to meet these extremely high financial assurance requirements. Allowing the bespoke option only when an operator can show undue hardship and requiring a presumption against an operator pursuing this path thwarts this objective. Now in pursuing the bespoke path, operators should have to explain what their financial assurance would be under the option structure and why a tailored plan is preferable. And they should also be required to give supporting circumstances demonstrating but operators shouldn't have to overcome a presumption or make some other type of variance showing to go before the commission with a proposed plan. <clears throat> it's also unclear to me why only operators who are public entities will have access to a comprehensive bond. As you heard from our expert, Mr. Trevor Gilstrap, surety bonds can be difficult to obtain in this marketplace. For an operator to obtain a surety bond, surety must be determined through a rigorous review process that the operator has ample financial capability to meet all of its, its obligations. 
I submit that in this market and in future marketplaces, only the financially strongest operators will be in a position to obtain a $30 million surety bond. Private companies who have these levels of resources should be able to choose option six by posting a comprehensive bond. And finally, applications for financial bonding should be able to be administratively approved in the same fashion as option one and two. Qualifying operators could provide detailed audited financial information confirming their ability <clears throat> to fulfill all financial assurance requirements. And as mentioned, they would also have third party confirmation that they can satisfy their assurance obligations from the surety providing the bond. <clears throat> Ultimately, the financial risks of wells covered by a comprehensive bond is extremely low and allowing administrative approval would free up the commission on operators with riskier profiles. I will now pass the presentation on to Mr. Kochlesher. Bye, please. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Chris Kochlesher, and I am testifying to leak inspections for out-of-service wells. Um, COGA is a little bit surprised to be covering air quality in a financial assurance rulemaking, especially given the Air Commission's stringent regulations in this area. But I honestly, apologize. I apologize for interrupting you, Chris. Um, excuse me, Mr. McDonald, could you please advance the slides, two slides? Thank you. But on the substance, COGA can accept staff's February 11th version of Rule 434D11D, requiring annual AVO inspections of the wellheads at out of service wells. COGA opposes Conservation Colorado's November proposal to require AIM inspections. We also oppose the concepts from the ALGC's January 26th slide deck which recommended that operators notify COGCC of leaks detected from out-of-service wells. We also understand that we may see new language today from the ALGC, and this language may include using SOAP solutions to inspect for leaks. COGA is concerned about the late submittal of new language. Using a SOAP solution for the entire facility is impractical. You would need to hose down the site with SOAP and then watch for bubbles. But finally, the party's proposals are unnecessary because out-of-service wells are not a significant source of emissions, and CDPHE already has a comprehensive LDAR program. Turning to the Air Commission's rules, to my knowledge, they have been the most aggressive in the country since 2014, and a rule change from December will approximately double the number of mandatory inspections starting in 2023. The Air Commission has LDAR covered. The rules have required monthly ADO inspections since 2016, even at the lowest tier of well production facilities all the way down to facilities with zero to two tons per year of VOC emissions. The lowest emitting well production facilities historically needed only a one-time AIM inspection, but will receive annual or semi-annual AIM inspections starting next year. AIM inspections are more frequent at higher emitting facilities and those located in disproportionately impacted communities in proximity to occupied areas and in the ozone area. The AIM schedule for the upper tiers is not very relevant here since you would expect out of service wells to be in the zero to two ton per year tier, but I can display that schedule if you have questions. Next slide, please. Operators cannot just stop inspecting well production facilities when they're not producing. The Air Division addressed shut-in wells in PS Memo 1404, and the division intends for operators to inspect any pressurized equipment, even if the facility is shut in. Next slide, please. And I'm told the commission had questions about the repair schedule. It's fast. Within DICs or in proximity to occupied areas, operators must make the first attempt and complete repair within five days. At other well sites statewide, the first attempt is within five days and repair must be completed within 30 working days. Operators must verify that the repair was effective 15 days later. Operators also keep records for all facilities statewide including records of any leaks that could not be timely repaired and were placed on delay of repair, and they submit annual reports to the Air Division. This is a comprehensive and aggressive LDAR program. And while additional COGCC rules are not needed here, COGA can accept staff's proposed annual ABO rule, but it would be unduly burdensome to require operators to submit additional reports of the same inspections to a second agency. With that, I'll turn it back to Mark. Thank you, Chris. Change the slide, please. I will now be addressing the draft rules requirements for single well financial assurance for all transferred wells. COCA believes this requirement is unproductive and unnecessary. 
Instead, financial assurance for all transferred wells should be determined based on the buying operator's financial assurance option level. As an initial matter, the dangers of well-funded operators dumping bad assets on barely surviving operators has been exaggerated. COGA pulled from the COGCC website a listing of all wells transferred from one operator to another operator from January 1, 2018 to the end of 2021. Then using the option structure in the draft rules and production data, it classified each of the transferers, transferee and transferer of each transaction based upon the option level uh, on both sides of the transaction. We found some interesting conclusions. First, most transfers involved operators in the same tier. And this is particularly the case with regard to option one and option two. That is, most transfers occurred between a seller and a buyer that were not financially vulnerable. Second, with regard to the transfer of wells between operators of different option levels, the data shows that there were more transfers of wells from a financially vulnerable operator to an operator with stronger financials than the other way around. That is, it was more common for an option one operator to be on the receiving end of a transfer of wells from an option four operator than it was <clears throat> to see a transfer from an option four operator to an option one operator. Please change the slide. Finally, and this follows from the conclusions above, relatively few transfers of wells involve the transferring of wells uh, <clears throat> by the most financially viable operators to the least financially viable operators. The slide you are seeing now breaks down transfers again from the beginning of 2018 to the end of 2021. The option level of the selling company is shown in the left vertical column with the designation of former operator. The option level of the acquiring company is shown in the upper horizontal column under the designation current operator. So you can see that the total number of well transfers is listed uh, under the bottom in the bottom right column at 12,882. And you can also see that over the last four years, option one operators transferred only 94 wells to option four operators. And option two operators transferred only 172 wells to option four operators. Point is that most transfers occurred between a seller and a buyer that were not financially vulnerable and there were relatively few transactions in, with oper in which operators with strong financials transferred wells to operators with the weakest financials. These are favorable trends that should be encouraged by the draft rules and not discouraged. <clears throat> the commission can do this by trusting the tier network you have designed, the option network, to govern the transfer of wells rather than require single well financial assurance for all transfers. This would accomplish three major objectives. First, it would encourage operators with stronger finances to accept transfers of wells from more financially vulnerable operators. Under this scenario, an operator in option one or two or six will be encouraged to accept wells from an option three or four operator because even though their financial assurance requirement would likely increase because of the transferred wells, they will not have to pay single well financial assurance for each of the transferred wells. By contrast, requiring single well financial assurance for all transfers of wells thwarts this objective. It makes no sense for an option one or two operator who enjoys blanket bonding for its active wells to assume a set of active wells for which it now it will have to pay single well financial assurance for the life of each of these wells. This, I submit, will discourage beneficial future transfers. <clears throat> the use of the option structure also works because it will discourage and indeed usually make impossible the transfer of wells to option four operators because transfer of these wells will only occur if the option four operator can pay single well financial assurance for all of the transferred wells it receives. 
I submit that every one of these so-called problem transfers highlighted by the party's submission throughout this entire rulemaking would not have occurred under the option structure in the draft rules because every recipient of the transferred wells would have been required to post single well financial assurance for each transferred well prior to the transaction and this would not have occurred. This is exactly the results you want these rules to have. Finally, the use of single well financial assurance for all transfers will stymie the creativity of operators who have shown the ability to accept low producing and inactive wells and turn them into consistently productive wells. <clears throat> As an example, we've heard from Evergreen Resources in this rulemaking, the coal bed methane capture company in Los Animas County, which has received through transfer inactive and extremely low producing wells and re-stimulated those wells to achieve consistent production. In this process, it has substantially reduced the naturally occurring methane seepage into the atmosphere while also generating agricultural grade water. If you require single well financial assurance for all transferred wells, Evergreen Resources business model will likely be stopped in its tracks. Adopting the option structure at least give, gives companies like Evergreen the chance to still acquire these transferred zombie wells in order to bring them back online. For all of these reasons, I strongly encourage you to trust your option structure to address the transfer of wells. Again, it encourages the transfer of wells to operators with strong financials, which will help to prevent the expansion of the orphan well population and strongly discourages those transfers of wells to vulnerable operators who everyone agrees are the real problem. Acquiring single well financial assurance by contrast for all transfers does not achieve these objectives and indeed would bring the transfer of wells between parties to a complete standstill. <clears throat> Finally, I would like to uh, talk about single well financial assurance for new wells and COGA applauds the draft rules not requiring single well financial assurance for new wells. But because we're going first, we would like to address some of the comments you are likely to hear in the next couple of days. As it does with transfers, the option structure works very well with respect to new wells. Under this option structure, stronger operators will fold their new wells into their blanket or comprehensive bonds, while operators in lower tiers will have to post single well financial assurance for the life of each new well. This incentive structure works and certainly works better than requiring single well financial assurance for all new wells for all operators. We've been told by certain larger operators that they may construct up to 150 to 200 new wells a year or more in the near future. And we know of several smaller oil and gas companies that plan on applying for up to 75 new wells a year in the near future. Under single well financial assurance, this would require bonding of at least seven to 20 million a year. In addition, a year in addition to the very high financial assurance they will already be paying under the draft rules. It bears repeating that this exorbitant amount will not be available to these operators for the entire life of these wells. And an operator certainly can't use this money to plug and abandon its own well fleet. And we question the need for the vast amount of additional bonding that would be required by imposing single well financial assurance for new wells this would represent a huge bonding sum for new wells on top of what already will be the most stringent financial assurance program in the United States. As I mentioned earlier, most operators will be required to at least triple their total amount of financial assurance under the new rules, and many operators will have to pay even higher multiples of their current amount of assurance. There's simply no need to add to these already astronomical financial assurance amounts a further charge of millions of dollars for full cost bonding of new wells. This is particularly the case because the orphan well program will be swelling with proceeds from the proposed well registration fee and the federal contribution. Most of which from past practice, we do not believe will be able to be used to retire all of the orphan wells that are available. This concludes my remarks. Thank you for your time today. And I'll pass the presentation on to Ms. Ryan. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
With this slide, I'd like to discuss a small request for clarification. This is the latest draft rule regarding insurance. Uh, the, the clean language is up, that's staff's draft. And staff has increased the required per occurrence insurance coverage amount from $1 million to $5 million. Now in the October 29th statement of basis and purpose, the commission did say that it found a million dollars a reasonable amount based on typical remediation costs. So the amount, you know, looks to be a bit on the high end, but that being said, COCA can support the increase. However, COCA does request that this rule be amended to see, to include the red line language you see on this slide. We understand from our insurance contact, Mr. Gilstrap, that you heard from last month, as well as from operators, that most commonly operators have multiple insurance policies that cover their operations. And so we understand that while many operators do carry insurance in the amount of $5 million, that primary policy coverage in that amount is atypical. So our language clarifies that the coverage required by Rule 705B may be satisfied through a combination of policies. And importantly, the, the type of policy an operator holds is irrelevant in terms of protection for the COGCC and third parties. We're simply allow, allowing, uh, requesting that it be specified that it can be obtained through multiple policies. Next slide, please. Switching to transfer, COGA has two proposed revisions. First, COGA recommends that oil and gas development plan, comprehensive area plan, and form two applications that have passed completeness be eligible for transfer. The commission is aware of the time, cost, and effort operators incur with it when preparing such applications. I think as you talked about yesterday, you're aware that submitting an application can sometimes take years. And when operators incur such uh, resource intensive processes. This is the same for staff as well. Staff conducts an intense completeness review process. And so to avoid duplicative efforts of a buying operator and staff having to redo work that's already been done, the commission should allow complete applications to be transferred. And COGA has suggested in certain submittals that the statement of basis and purpose could expressly recognize that the transfer of a pending application and corresponding permit documents does not in any way guarantee, suggest, hint that the application will ultimately be approved by the commission or the director as applicable. The application will, would continue to proceed as normal under the commission's rules in the act as any other application. Next slide, please. COGA continues to believe that it is counterintuitive and confusing to consider a well that is producing, albeit in small quantities, an inactive well. The proposed definition engenders further, further confusion because in the flow line and crude oil transfer line context under current rule 1101A3, an out of service flow line or crude, crude oil transfer line means a pipeline associated, associated, quote, with an inactive well, end quote. An out of service flow line or crude oil transfer line associated with an inactive well must be isolated and disconnected from the well. Accordingly, an out of service flow line or crude oil transfer line is incapable of being used, but an inactive well under the draft definition is capable of being used and in fact, maybe being used, just not producing at the volumes required to not be in an inactive designation. So if there's a production standard for an inactive well, then the commission will have to have two definitions of an inactive well, one for financial assurance purposes and one for operational purposes. But this just invites confusion. COGA urges the commission to revert to staff's December 7 version. I also wanted to note that there appears to have been some commissioner confusion regarding Texas's definition of an inactive well, and I put this up on the slide as well. Texas's definition of an inactive well does not in fact have a production threshold. Rather, the Texas definition hews closely to staff's December 7th version. And in Texas, an inactive well is a well that has reported no production, disposal, injection, or other permitted activity for a period of greater than 12 months. 
Production volumes become relevant in Texas only when a well is inactive. Once a well is in inactive status under the definition I just read to you, then a production threshold is necessary to remove the well from inactive status, but a well will not be in an active status in the first place if it has any reportable production. Next slide, please. Finally, COGA asks that the commission consider statement of basis and purpose language that leaves the door open for buying operators to request variances pursuant to which they may return transferred out of service wells to hydrocarbon production. COGA believes it is more than appropriate for the commission to have an expectation that out of service wells remain out of service and are timely plugged. And this includes being timely plugged by a buying operator. However, if a buying operator can put an out of service well to beneficial use, it makes sense to allow an operator to do that where the buying operator can articulate to the commission satisfaction why a change of plans for the well is justified. Consider a scenario where operator A places wells on a plugging list because the wells are not economic. Operator B realizes that it has sophisticated engineering capabilities that it could apply to re-optimize the wells. For example, the situation you heard about from Evergreen Natural Resources. It makes sense to allow the buying operator to return the wells to beneficial use and allow for the reuse of existing infrastructure under this circumstance or other similar circumstances completely precluding a buying operator from returning an out of service well to production could actually ultimately lead in more impacts because if new development comes to the area where that new development could and would have reused that existing infrastructure, that opportunity was already foreclosed. That concludes COGA's presentation and we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for the presentation. Um, during Mr. Kolkler's presentation, my computer decided to reboot. And so I was knocked offline for a period of time. Um, that is a reminder that it is helpful for you to provide your slides um, to Ms. Larson so that we can have access to them. Um, with that, uh, are there questions for the panel? Commissioner McCallum. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for your presentation this morning. I, I would like to start with the AIM versus AVO um, discussion uh, because I, I've, been, I've been trying to figure out um, what the issue is that some of our stakeholders um, think there might be with the out-of-service wells. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to explain what I think the issue is, and I'd, I'd like to hear uh, your response and and how we might assure that this is not an issue. So through the AIM program, wells that are shut in per a CDPHE memo fall under the AIM program, which is a leak detection and repair kind of program, which implies that you go and test for a leak and repair as soon as possible. And you have five days-ish to repair and if you can't, you need to let CDPHE know why you can't. But you have, if I'm understanding, you have potentially up to two years to fix the leak if you if you have to buy special equipment and you can't get it under, under special circumstances. And I'm sure we're gonna hear more from some stakeholders later, but I, I wanna make sure that I get your thoughts about this. What I'm hearing is that those wells that might be leaking for quite some time might be on the out of service list and the commission might want to know what, who, which wells are in that situation so that we can prioritize them for plugging so we don't have leaking wells on the out of service list sitting there for a period of time. And so could you respond to that first, please? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, there are provisions in the Air Commission regulations for delay of repair. If the leak cannot be repaired within the five or 30 day time frame. It can be placed on the delayed repair list that the operator must keep records of that. Uh, typically when a leak is placed on delay of repair, it's either because parts are unavailable and they need to be, special parts need to be ordered or it's because there are some operational requirements where the facility may need to be shut in if it's still operating 
that's not applicable here. The facility may need to be shut in before you can repair, or it may require some special equipment. So there are some cases, this is unusual, but there can be cases where you have a, a problem downhole that is contributing to a leak and you need to bring in a workover rig and that typically cannot be done within 30 days. So if you're in that situation where you can't meet the repair deadline, it is placed on the delay of repair list. The air division has some requirements to ensure that the delayed repair list is not abused. So operators do need to keep track of their parts ordering, the date the part was ordered, the date the part was received. Um, and in some situations where the facility is within proximity to an occupied area, or if it's within a disproportionately impacted community, there is also an immediate reporting requirement to inform the division that the, the leak was not timely repaired. Um, the operator also has obligations in that situation to take additional steps to stop the leak. Um, the language is that if repair is not completed within five working days, again, this is within proximity to occupied areas or DICs, the owner or operator must use other means to stop the leak, including but not limited to isolating the component or shutting in the well, unless such other means will cause greater emissions. So the Air Commission does have a pretty comprehensive scheme about addressing these situations where the leak cannot be repaired within the time frame, and having oversight of those operators to ensure that uh, that, that process is followed. Thank you. So, so if there are some instances where a well cannot be repaired within the 30 days and you need, um, because of a special circumstance, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, what your thoughts are about um, letting the commission know which out of service wells are in that situation so they can be prioritized on the out of service list and we just plug them instead of waiting for the leaking, we wanna move them up and just plug them in and be done with it. Sorry, I don't know how to say it differently. <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, my guess, while I'm not a technical expert, is that in most cases it will still be repaired faster than you could plug the well. Um, if it takes some time to bring in a, a workover rig, for example, to do the work down hole, I think that would be a shorter period of time than actually doing the full plugging operation on the well. Um, you mentioned a two year time frame previously. That two years um, is in effect, that, that two years applies to situations where you must shut down the facility or shut in the facility in order to repair the leak. And so I don't think that two year time frame would come into effect here because the well is already out of service. So you're really only talking about leaks that are on delay because the part is unavailable or you need to bring in special equipment. So could I clarify, are you, are, are you telling me that if it, if it takes longer than 30 days, that well will be shut in while you're waiting for equipment and would no longer be leaking? So th that the really the window of, of concern we 30 days, the two years is you it's shut in for up to two years while you're waiting for equipment or whatever the circumstance is. I'm saying that this I'm trying question, to figure out how long the window can be where we might be worried about right. an out of service well that might be leaking. And if people could stop um, the chat is I, I know folks have things to say, but it's a little distracting when we're trying to talk and people are trying to opine while we're talking. And I know I'm hopefully people will bring up their issues when they get in front of us and I'm willing to ask questions too, but it's it's a little distracting. Sorry, Mr. Klokischer. No, thank you. My point is that the two-year deadline is not relevant here. The two years comes into play when you have to shut in the facility in order to repair the leak. And because we're talking about out of service wells that are already not producing, I just don't see how the, the shutdown requirement could come into play. These, these wells are already shut in. Okay, so that this is gonna lead me down another path that I would like to talk to you about, which is um, I don't see in the rules any sort of time frame. Um, so I'm gonna back up. My understanding from talking to some oper operators about what happens with an out of service well is in my opinion, after certain things are done, um, risk of leak is pretty low. There's a, a plug put down the well, all the equipment has been purged. There's no hydrocarbon sitting in any of the tanks. The, the opportunity for a leak should be pretty darn low. But what is not in our rules, once you get onto the out of service list, 
is a time frame within which all these things that classify you as out of service must happen. So um, I'm wondering if we need to, in order, a way for me to not have to worry about the ABO versus the AIM program or whatever is to say, once a, a, a well is on our out of service list, those things that, that classify you as out of service have to happen within X number of days or a time frame. Do you have a, some, some thoughts about that? I think I would defer to either um, Mr. Matthews or Ms. Ryan about the, the criteria for when wells are placed out of service. Mr. Matthews? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think if, if those deadlines were fairly reasonable, that perhaps could be implemented if that would take this issue off the table. Uh, we have not spoken to specific operators about that issue. Uh, Commissioner McGowan, and so perhaps more information will come to light in the next day. I, I would definitely um, appreciate some um, your some feedback, and I I realize this is like you don't have to answer right now, but I would appreciate some feedback on that. And sure. So while we're still on this topic, um, I, I know that there has been a request to use brain head testing instead of MIT for out of service wells. I hope I'm getting this all straight. Um, and I've heard that the Braden, so that the Braden head might also not be appropriate to find the leaks. So I guess I'm going back to, if we had like a time frame for out of service wells to get addressed, that might help address the concern about a Braden head, which is testing pressure that might find a leak, but not leaks elsewhere um, with the equipment. So I'm, I'll put that out there, just food for thought. And I look forward to some feedback. Um, I need to think about my other questions, but that's why I was, <laughs> so I'll come back. So I defer Mr. Chair to someone else. Other commissioners with questions? Commissioner Mag uh, Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you all for being here and for your testimony. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, again, on this, uh, the, the AVO inspections that are already required by, a, by the Air Commission um, for, for monthly inspections. I believe you said that there was it was be an un, it would be an undue burden to send a report to another agency. Why is that? To just email it to another agency? What's the undue burden? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, operators are already submitting the report to one agency, and it's already being tracked. And that program has been effective. And while it may seem like a small thing to submit a report, reports to different agencies typically have different formats. They often have different deadlines and it is uh, complicated for operators to track the, the very long list of record keeping and reporting requirements that they have to multiple different agencies and submitting the same information to two different agencies in two different formats on two different time frames does create a burden and frankly don't see the, the benefit in submitting that report. I, I think it's also notable when you look at the benefits of submitting that report to look at how the leaks are addressed in the Air Commission regulations, where one of your options for addressing a leak, if, if you're not able to actually repair a leak, the way that you can respond instead is to shut in the facility. And again, we're talking about a situation where that has already happened. And, and so it seems like the, the benefits of this leak inspection program um, are really very small because we're talking about, um, as the staff report had noted and Commissioner McGowan had noted, facilities where you would not expect leaks to occur very often or to be very large if they do occur. And you do have repair deadlines in place. Operators are obligated to repair these leaks. Okay. Um, I, um, I guess I'm still not understanding though, if, if, if it wasn't a different format required, if, if our requirement was send us a copy of what you're sending, AQCC each month. Is there a problem there? It, it's certainly less burdensome to send a copy of what's already being submitted to the Air Division. Um, I, I would just point out that the reporting requirements for the Air Division are an annual report um, for statewide wells, and then enhanced reporting, more frequent reports for these facilities that are within DICs or in proximity. So it won't be a monthly report in every case, but I, I think if the 
requirement is to simply submit a copy of what is already going to the air division, that's, that's probably acceptable. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Messner. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you all for your presentation today. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pound on this one a little a little more. Um, I mean I'm I'm struggling here with the big deal as a reporting requirement for this particular situation because it, uh, as COGCC would utilize it, it would be a developing a prioritization or informing a, pri a potential prioritization of OOS wells, um, which is to me a valuable utilization of information, and this is an ask to provide information on perhaps a different schedule than AQCCC, which is you know, an annual schedule on particular leak situations so that COGCC is informed if there's potential leaks uh, in situations that may modify potential prioritization of out of service wells to ensure ultimately what our mission is, which is the protection of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, wildlife resources, taking into consideration disproportionately impacted communities. And so it seems, I guess I'm struggling a little bit with what I would argue would be a relatively simple reporting requirement in a situation where you're already acknowledging that there's a situation, you're going to report it to AQCC and you're just creating an opportunity for notice and information to COGCC. To me, that seems like a simple opportunity for transparency and communication, which is what we've always said our form system is, is a dialogue between operators and the COGCC. So I'm struggling with this one a little bit as far as the opposition to it. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Those are good questions. Um, two points. First, I would say that things that may look simple on the outside are often much harder when you're actually the one doing it. And operators have very extensive reporting requirements. They have, um, uh, it, it takes a lot of manpower and it takes a lot of uh, software and database systems in order to make sure that they meet these reporting requirements. So it is, it does have an impact on the operators. And I think, again, it's important to look at the trade-off between the benefits and the burdens. And while it may seem like a small burden, we feel like there's really very little benefit because this program is already very aggressive and comprehensive within the Air Commission. It is functioning well and we really don't see where this would actually reduce emissions to have a second agency regulating the same activity. Um, it's important to um, allocate or divide responsibility for projects among agencies. I recognize that the jurisdictional changes from Senate Bill 181, but it's still beneficial for multiple state agencies to uh, allow sister agencies to handle projects that they're already handling. And the second point I would like to make is that while we have talked to an extent about AIM inspections, really the, the staff's proposed rule is about AVO inspections, which would be an annual inspection covered on an annual report with a very short repair deadline. I mean, A, <clears throat> I would argue that the proposed consideration of a, of a of a reporting requirement, a notice requirement in order to inform COGCC on a potential prioritization of OOS wells is not the duplicate regulatory process, right? And so I would argue that that's not actually what's happening here, but rather a notice and communication element uh, between agencies. Um, however, I mean, you've made your, your point, and so we can agree to disagree on that one perhaps. Um, so, um, I think, I think, I think I'll leave it at that at this point, but I'm, I'm, I'm still, it's not clear to me that, that there, that it would be unbeneficial, uh, rather it would actually help for transparency and be a beneficial opportunity for information and communication to be shared and, um, help inform some decision-making around prioritization. So. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we might hear from some folks later on um, related to the option structure that about energy equivalency and barrels versus MCF and whether or not um, 
the, the options have natural gas levels that are extraordinarily low that allow very low producers to be in tier one, or sorry, option one and option two. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I guess my contribution to that would be, uh, I, I wonder why they are saying that. When we uh, did our analysis, for example, of the 12,000 transfers using the uh, BOE and MCFE in the draft rules, uh, only 11% of the operators analyzed were option one and 11% were option two. 19% were option three and the majority, 59% were option four. Now, a lot of those option four operators have a very small number of wells. Seems to me that a tier structure working backwards, Commissioner McGowan, <clears throat> that only has 22% in the top two options is not um, giving undue deference. Uh, <clears throat> so I, th I think that's, that's one response to that concern. Commissioner McGowan, also just more generally, it, it is important to have both um, metrics because it's important to separate the oil play from the gas play. You've heard a lot about this. It's, it's different operations, different systems. So we just want uh, to look at them the correct way because it's really not an apples to apples comparison. Thank you. Could, sorry, um, Mr. Matthews, could you, could you um, confirm that what you're telling me is 11% uh, of operators or 11% of the wells are in options one and two? Yeah, it's by the operators. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And um, in in the presentation that you gave, where you showed transfers between operators and then put them into um, the options that they could be in under the draft structure, do you know what percentage of those were transfers of like acreage, which I think would be exempt under the the current draft? I'm sorry, were transfers of what? Of like acreage, which I think we've, which I think in the, I'm calling it the blue line, um, right, is an exemption. No, I, I don't. Uh, I suspect in uh, discussing the results of this data with the gentleman Dave Coolman who did it, uh, and in particular some of the larger transactions that informed our table, that it would be, and now I'm speaking wells and not operators, it would be a relatively um, low percentage, Commissioner McGowan, because a lot of the, I'll just say the bulk transfers, the majority transfers uh, involved a, a large shipment of transferred wells and didn't involve a like acreage swap. That's anecdotal, but it's based on the four or five biggest uh, examples we looked at of transactions. Okay, thank you. Any further follow-up from commissioners for the panel? All right, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and being with us this morning, we appreciate it. Thank you. And I note that you have filed your PowerPoint with us, so thank you for that too. Okay, we will continue with party presentations. Uh, we will now bring to the panel uh, the American Petroleum Institute uh, for Colorado. Good morning, Chair Robbins. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, Mr. Martin, we can hear you. Terrific, thank you. Um, just checking to see, or perhaps I might ask Ms. Larson whether Mr. Paulus and Mr. obviously Mr. Prendergast has joined us. Um, hoping Mr. Paulus also will join us. We have Mr. Paulus, we can Great. see him. Great, thank you. As always, thank you to Secretary Larson. Um, I'm ready to go, Commissioner Chairman. 
Yes. Great. Well, good morning, Commissioners, Director Murphy. Uh, once again, this is Jim Martin from Beatty Wozniak on behalf of API Colorado. If we could go to slide two, Justin. So as we near the end of this road, a long road has been, and on behalf of API Colorado, I wanna thank the commissioners for your service. I've sat in your chairs, it's been a while, but I've been there and I have a good sense of how demanding the past few weeks have been. So again, from us to you, thank you. I also can't uh, pass up the opportunity, opportunity to thank um, Director Murphy for her patience with all of us all of those telephone calls, um, all of those emails, all of those meetings, and for all the work she and her team have put into this. So thank you to her as well. <clears throat> and um, at the outset, I'd also like to reintroduce to you Mr. Paulus of API Colorado. You've seen, seen him in the past quite a few times, but um, he's rejoined us this morning uh, and then will be available to answer questions about the AIM versus AVO issue, which took up a bit of your time with COGA just a second ago. Also a quick introduction to Justin Prendergast who will be managing this, uh, this slideshow since that reduces by 100% the likelihood of a technical failure on my part. Uh, if you'd go to slide three, Justin. So on to work. API Colorado believes this set of draft rules, so the most recent set of draft rules reflects significant improvement over previous drafts and API Colorado generally supports the proposed rules. We do have some thoughts on these five specific areas, but I promise not to take the full 30 minutes. Slide four, Justin. So on the subject of establishing a robust orphan well program, or API Colorado has consistently supported the concept of a ro robust orphan well fund, and we see it as a critical backstop or complement to financial assurance. In terms of funding, uh, we still firmly believe that a per well fee is the fairest and most efficient mechanism for funding an orphan well fund at whatever level the commission sets it. It's easy to administer, it involves some very simple math, it is also, in our view, the most equitable. Operators with, operators with a large number of wells pay more than operators with few wells. A production fee would be both, both more complicated and inequitable, as is a mechanism that relies upon well depth, well depth. It's no fairer and the math there is even more challenging for a staff that already has plenty of work to do. Facing costs on well depth would penalize operators where wells are necessarily deeper and those with a large number of wells. Slide five, Justin. So where does that leave us? We suggest a simple alternative that um, is a logical outgrowth to what we've been talking about all along, which is to base funding on a per well fee of somewhere between $100 and $2 per well, but only for operators in options one, two, and six. With the important caveat that we also suggest that the commission set a lower per well fee for operators in options three and four, and perhaps five. This seems to combine the merits of simplicity as well as fairness. Next slide, Justin. Shifting now to out of surface wells, out of service wells, excuse me, API Colorado supports the current draft rules. The staff draft responded to industry concerns and made the designation of wells self affecting but with the opportunity for director review. The new draft sets enforceable deadlines for plugging and abandoning wells on the plugging list, and it, it, and it acknowledges that wells should be removed from the plugging list once wells are plugged and reclamation and remediation have commenced. But we have one caution for the commission. We urge you to avoid creating new compliance burdens for operators that place wells on a plugging list. By, do, by doing so, you would risk creating disincentives to using the out-of-service program altogether. Slide seven, please. The proposal from local governments, or at least the rumors we hear about what the proposal from govern, local governments will look like to impose some sort of new leaking testing requirements or repair requirements or notice requirements for inactive wells is just such an example of an undesirable and unnecessary new compliance burden. AP, API Colorado has a number of concerns respecting the local, what we believe the local governments may propose to you tomorrow. 
First, we are unclear whether this proposal fits within the scope of the notice of rulemaking. To put it bluntly and simply, this is a rulemaking about financial assurance and orphan wells, not leak detection and repair. Moreover, the Air Quality Control Commission just a few months ago completed yet another in a series of rulemakings in which the details of leak detection and repair were argued, debated, and ultimately resolved in a new set of regulations on the subject. In addition, the uncontradicted evidence before, she, before you also is on point. Moving to the next slide, Justin. On that score, we want to call your attention again to a literature review completed last year by former Assistant Attorney General Minor. You see here some of the conclusions from that report, which is available on the Commission website. First, emissions from plugged wells are near zero. And second, idle wells emit methane at low levels that are at least an order of magnitude below those of active wells. Slide nine, please. At the same time, the Air Division has in place a comprehensive and extremely complex regulatory structure for identifying and repairing leaks. And I, I wanna emphasize two things here. First, the program is complex and I'll be pro providing you a glimpse into those regulations in just a moment. But second, the regulations set a rigorous schedule for the identification, repair, and re-monitoring of any leaks identified in the leak detection surveys. To boil it down, if an operator finds a leak, the operator must repair the leak within the timeframes noted by Mr. Coplasier, then re-monitor the site to ensure the leak was repaired. Slide 10, please. So here's a table excerpted from the Air Division's regulations currently in effect, setting the thresholds and frequencies for leak surveys, both AIM and AVO. You can see the thresholds on the left two columns and the survey frequencies on the right. The thresholds start at well production facilities with the potential to emit of zero to two tons per year. Currently, they are subject to a one-time AIM survey. But I also wanna point out that well production facilities, every one gets a monthly auditory, visual, and olfactory survey. Every well production facility, every month. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows the, what the thresholds and frequencies will be at the start of the new year. Even facilities with a very low potential to emit will get annual AIM inspections. The biggest facilities get monthly AIM inspections. And again, every facility gets a monthly ABO inspection. This slide reflects the results of the brutal rulemaking completed just last December. I think it was at least the fifth rulemaking at the commission, at the Air Commission, excuse me, to consider LDAR requirements for the upstream oil and gas production sector. Slide 12, please. Now you may be wondering uh, about what happens when the facility is shut in. The Air Division is, has issued this guidance that requires AIM and AVO inspections for idle, or in other words, shut in facilities, where any pressurized equipment contains or contacts a process stream with hydrocarbons. Tomorrow, tomorrow you may, emphasis on may, because we haven't seen what the local governments may propose, which raises a due process issue all its own. But you may hear a proposal that during annual ABO surveys, inspectors should use soapy water to identify leaks from a wellhead. While API Colorado can support staff's proposed annual ABO inspections, we oppose the requirement to use soapy water to test for leaks. It would significantly increase inspection time and it just isn't necessary. You also may hear a proposal requiring notice to this commission as well as to the division in cases where the repairs are delayed. We believe that would be a duplicative requirement that so far as we can see provides little if any air quality benefit. Next slide, please. As I noted, we don't know for sure what the local governments will propose to you tomorrow. But regardless, API Colorado strongly urges you to leave these issues to the agency with experience in this area. The commission doesn't have an air office and it lacks expertise in this area. The Air Commission and Air Division have been working at this, at this for years now. And I wanna remind you that their requirements require periodic inspections, repair within relatively short periods of time and re-monitoring to ensure the leak was repaired. 
We strongly urge you to conclude that the local governments have brought their ideas to the wrong forum. Next slide, please. So segueing to a much less, or at least I hope a less troublesome issue, I'd like to touch on the subject of transfers. As our expert witness testified, transfers, especially transfers of idle wells, deserve scrutiny since they can increase risk to the state. However, however we're concerned that the staff draft sweeps too broadly and would effectively freeze operators in place since the restrictions will operate as significant disincentives to future transfers. We appreciate the proposed off-ramp for like-kind exchanges. We suggest an additional off-ramp for transfers among option one, two, and six operators. We believe such transfers would pose minimal, to the, minimal risk to the state and potentially even have benefits for the state. Next slide, please. So talking about options, uh, I have to admit, I'm still uh, uh, using the word tears all too often, but um, I'll try to stick to options. Next slide, please. API Colorado appreciates the clarity the staff has brought to this part of the proposed rules. In particular, we strongly support option six. Publicly traded companies are in a position to provide significant financial assurance to the commission to attest to their ability to fulfill all of their obligations under the statute and regulations. Consequently, the financial risk to the state of such operators is very low. Next slide, please. We do have one, one modest suggestion to offer. There seem to be a lot of similar, similarities between options one, two, and option six. It doesn't seem review of financial assurance plans for these categories of operators would require a significant exercise of judgment. Instead, this seems to be another place where it makes sense to permit director to permit director approval of financial assurance plans. Next slide, please. So with respect to option, option five, we have two suggestions. First, as we read the proposed rules, any operator could avail, avail itself of this option if it thinks it can meet the stated criteria. We believe preserving that option for operators is important. Moving on, uh, second, as we read the eligibility criteria for option five, they set clear and potentially demanding standards for submission of a financial assurance plan under option five. The operator must demonstrate its individual circumstances. They have to demonstrate their financial health and they must explain why they believe an exception to the financial assurance amounts that otherwise apply is unwarranted, or is warranted rather. Next slide, please. In that light, we don't quibble with those standards. However, we're troubled by the ad ad additional criterion of undue hardship. That legal standard implies a very high bar for eligibility. Moreover, it seems unnecessary in light of the other criteria for eligibility. We also note that the commission in this instance has broad latitude under these rules and the undue hardship criterion is simply unnecessary. We urge you to reconsider the undue hardship barrier. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. With that, commissioners, I'm almost done. The last few days have given those of us at API Colorado a chance to step back and look at these rules as a whole. We believe the rules as proposed by the staff would establish a new paradigm for financial assurance. Next slide. The rules would include the complementary features of a robust orphan will fund, and financial assurance plans. They contemplate that the commission effectively could reject the transfer. The out of service program will result in the plugging and abandonment of many thousands of wells. The rules establish blanket bonds in combination with single well financial assurance requirements for what I'm calling excess inactive wells for the healthiest of operators and variations of single well financial assurance requirements for option three and option four operators. And the rules would establish a process for director and commissioner commission rather review of financial assurance plans along with annual reviews. Next slide, please. As a whole, in our view, the proposed rules comply with Senate Bill 181 because they ensure all operators can fill, fulfill all of their obligations under the statute and the commission's rules. And with that, I want to thank you. I yield back the rest of my time and we're available for any questions you may have, Chair Robbins and Commissioners. 
Thank you, Mr. Martin, for the presentation and for the availability of your witnesses uh, for us today. Justin, if you could uh, terminate or sign off, please. Thank you. Great. That made everyone a little bit bigger. We now see everybody yeah. a little bit better. Um, do folks have questions? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for sharing your information this morning. Um, I will ask what I asked Koga. Um, would it be too administratively burdensome just to report the wells that did not pass the AIM inspection so that they can be prioritized on the out of service list? So Commissioner, first of all, I want to apologize. I re just realized I hadn't shared my video during my presentation that was unintentional. It was nevertheless rude, so I apologize. Um, I'll get back to what I tried to emphasize during my presentation, and then I'll turn this over to um, Mr. Paulus. But I think it's really important to remember that leaks that are identified during these surveys have to be repaired and then re-monitored um, within relatively short periods of time. So I'm not sure how the prioritization would work for wells that have been, as I said, not only repaired, but re-monitored. I'm not sure, to be, um, this is probably rude too, but I'm not sure what the point is. And beyond that, I think um, API members are very concerned that this potentially creates another compliance burden that makes the out of service program less attractive than it otherwise would be. Um, there's always the concern about mission creep um, and also the concern that suddenly we'll end up, end up with a whole matrix of criteria for uh, developing plans for uh, plugging and abandoning out of service wells based on those and a host of other criteria. So I guess I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I also want to give Mr. Paulus an opportunity to respond. Mr. Paulus. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I first want to kind of step back and try to see if I can frame up some context, because often I have to provide direction in terms of how to approach a response to a leak. And so what I look at is in terms of, is this something that's caused by the subsurface and loss of well integrity? And so when you talk about wellheads and Christmas trees, and that's what you're trying to determine whether it's leaking, um, you have control valves and there's different names for them and not all wellheads are designed the same, but that control valve is intended to keep the pressure in the subsurface. And so if you are leaking from below the subsurface, that's a well integrity issue. And COGCC has rules in place, notifications, you know, processes, et cetera, to fix that. Once you get above the control valve, then that equipment, if it's still pressurized, falls under the various inspections that are subject to the AQCC's rules, where you're trying to look at various components for leaks. If that is depressurized because the well is out of service, you don't have potential for leaks to occur. So I would suggest that you try to understand kind of the cause of the leak or think of it as the source of the leak, because it goes to what Jim was saying in terms of how they're repaired. Many leaks are simple fixes. They might be connectors that just need to be tightened and they're done at the spot. You don't even need five days. Other leaks might take a special part if there's a valve or something. And most operators have spare parts on hand to make that connection. So when you're having these leaks that cannot be repaired, they're usually due to very unique situations. And Mr. Polkloser talked about some of the ones where you might have to shut in your operations. Again, that doesn't apply here when you're talking about out of service wells um, where you've already depressurized uh, the flow lines. The other thing I wanted to remind you that COGCC has rules on flow lines for taking them out of service and putting practices like lockout and tag out in place. So I'm trying to understand what problem we're trying to solve here. The reporting to me is kind of secondary you also have rules related to releases and spills. And if it's a sizable release or leak, there's obligations to report that to COGCC as well. So if you're trying to get reports in every single minor leak, I don't see what value that provides, especially if they're being repaired. If it's really something that's on the delayed repair list, but is 
going on for an extended period of time. Again, I, I don't see where that's applicable as uh, Mr. Kofiser explained in terms of the two years to shut down a facility. So I just wanted to offer that kind of background to, to understand you know, what conditions would warrant you know, reporting. And that's usually for something that is causing you know, an immediate threat that warrants a response immediately. And I think you already have those in your rules. Thank you. So um, what are your thoughts about then us adding to the out of service uh, list a time frame within which to depressurize those wells so that we know we don't have to worry about the other sister agency and what they're doing. We know that your wells have been, those wells on the out of service list have been depressurized. I think that's worth considering, but I don't know if it's now is the time and the place to, to vet that there may be other things that haven't been um, considered in, in doing that. But certainly, you know, most operators are going to uh, essentially, you know, take the equipment out of service, depressurize it. Um, and at that point, it's a matter and, you know, block out, tag out. And at that point, it's a matter of, you know, what other things need to be done to accommodate, you know, removing, um, you know, raining liquids in, in a tank, uh, et cetera, to essentially decommission uh, the equipment at that point. Commissioner McGonagall, I'm sorry, excuse me. Go ahead. Um, just one uh, comment. Um, the, the current draft from which we're working, February 11th draft, um, already requires that operators basically look at a series of things they must do for wells on their out of service list. And those include not only plugging and abandonment, but physical termination of electric service to associated production facilities, purging of all piping tanks, vessels, and other surface equipment, and application of OOSLOT consistent with the 1100 series. So those yeah, but are- I don't, I don't see time frames within there. Do you, Mr. Martin? No, they're not. They're, there are deadlines for um, plugging in abandonment, abandonment depending upon um, number of wells on the out of service list. Thank you. Mr. Martin, um, Back to your uh, proposal or to API's proposal about the orphan well fee yes, and trying to come up with something that's simple but is also equitable. Um, I noted that you spoke to one fee for what is it, one, two, and six? Yes, sir. And a separate fee that perhaps is lower for three and four. Um, was there some ideas around five? I wasn't quite sure what to do with. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Robbins. I, to be honest, I wasn't sure what to do with operators in option five since there will be individualized circumstances and conceivably uh, a wide variety of operators might take advantage of option five. So I, I was stumped by that. And this is an idea that only occurred to us in the last 24, 36 hours. So we haven't had a chance to give it the attention it deserves. Uh, but we do think it's an idea worth considering. And um, it obviously would be contingent on the number of dollars the commission decides it wants to raise each year. But we think it's a relatively simple matter to work backwards from there. And I, I, I honestly don't quite know what to do about option five. I, I'm sorry. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that um, that, that was the case. <laughs> I understand that things are moving quickly and ideas are being generated. I, I do like the simplicity of the approach. I have been struggling for something that's simple, but that is also fair and equitable. Um, so I think there's some merit there and we should all just sort of think about that. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? We appreciate your time this morning, Mr. Chair Robbins and commissioners. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing further commissioners, so I believe we will release the panel. Um, the next group is the um, Noble Group. Um, we did have a break scheduled. I'm just looking at our thing and lunch is at noon. Why don't we take our morning break? We've gone at it for an hour and a half. Let's take say 10 minutes and return at 1040, and then we'll bring the Noble Group in.
Sorry, folks. I know I'm a little late and I apologize. Good to see that everybody else is ready to go. You've got your screen shared and we are ready to hear from Noble PDC and Oxy. And I had this down for 30 minutes. Is that still the case or did you grab, grab more time, less time? No, we're still at 30 minutes, Chair. Okay. We'll then begin. Let's rock and roll. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Dave Neslin, and I'm appearing today with Matt Lepore on behalf of Colorado's three largest oil and gas operators, Noble, Oxy, and PDC. The companies drill lots of new wells, but they plug more than twice as many existing wells as they drill, so they offer a useful perspective on the draft rules. Our thanks to Director Murphy, the staff, and all of you for your hard work and perseverance throughout this process. I'll begin by discussing some of the most significant and beneficial aspects of the draft rules, which should serve as a model for other states. Next, Mr. Lepore will suggest several changes to the draft rules to make them more effective, efficient, and equitable. Finally, Mr. Lepore will address the issue of single well financial assurance for new wells, which we suspect other parties will raise tomorrow. Next slide, please. The draft rules are a significant improvement over prior drafts and include a number of what we call revolutionary reforms that not only fulfill the objectives of Senate Bill 19181, but go beyond the requirements of other states and will give Colorado the strongest financial assurance system in the country. For this purpose, I'm gonna highlight four requirements of the draft rules that are particularly valuable in precedent setting. First, the out of service well designation under rule 434D which results in not just bonding idle wells, but eliminating them and promises to lead to the plugging of thousands of wells this decade. Second, the requirements for single well financial assurance, that is full cost bonding for the riskiest operators and transfers under rules 218 and 702. This properly tailors financial assurance to risk and helps ensure that at-risk operators will have sufficient financial assurance to plug and reclaim their wells. Third, the $30 million comprehensive plugging bond for operators who are public companies in option six under rule 702. This would effectively be the largest oil and gas bond required by any state, and it would be a 300 fold increase in the current maximum COGCC bond. And the surety's issuance of the bond and public company reporting requirements would independently validate the operator's financial wherewithal and mitigate financial risk. Fourth, the more than $20 million annual orphan well fund resulting from rule 205, which would backstop the other requirements and provide a fourfold increase in funding if and when wells are orphaned. Next slide. I wanna talk about, uh, discuss uh, these requirements in a little bit more detail with you. The out of service designation process promises a win for everyone. It'll retire idle wells, which are less productive and less valuable. It'll avoid ongoing work and potential impacts associated with those wells. And it should be simple, predictable, and transparent in practice. It's superior to full cost bonding because the out of service process eliminates wells, not just, doesn't just bond them. Noble, Oxy, and PDC collectively plan to designate about 4,500 wells as out of service which will reduce the current statewide well count by about 9% and lead to almost a half a billion dollars in plugging work. All out of service wells must be plugged on a defined timeline and wells in disproportionately impacted communities and in high priority habitat designated in rule 1202C have to be prioritized. The operator has to report annually on the form 6B regarding its progress in plugging these wells. And if adequate prioritization is not demonstrated, the director can take punitive action, such as by requiring additional financial assurance or seeking full cost or single well financial assurance. The designation of wells as out of service will also benefit the public and the environment generally by reducing well site activities and traffic, eliminating emissions, and ensuring that the wells are plugged by a date certain, while requiring continued grade and head monitoring and testing and AVO inspections during the interim. Rule 434D is particularly well-crafted and reflects input from both industry and environmental groups like Conservation Colorado. 
it should be adopted in its current form. As others have discussed, and as Mr. Lepore will discuss as well, there is no need for additional LDAR requirements. Next slide. Today, inactive wells could remain temporarily abandoned or shut in indefinitely. No regulatory approval or fee is required, although they're subject to additional bonding of 10 to $20,000 per well. This requirement has been applied inconsistently. Noble, Oxy, and PDC, which have never orphaned a well and plug multiple wells for every well they drill, collectively carry about $100 million in excess inactive well bonds, which serve no real purpose. Higher risk operators may be underbonded, and no financial assurance is required for transfer wells. Under the draft rules, next slide. Under the draft rules, an operator has to return an active well to production within six months, or else provide single well financial assurance, plug the well, or designate the well as out of service and put it on the plugging list. Single well financial assurance at a defined amount of about $100,000 will replace the excess inactive well bonding, increasing the associated financial assurance five to tenfold. And single well financial assurance will also be required for transferred wells with what should be reasonable off ramps or less risky operators and transactions as Mr. Lepore will discuss. The comprehensive bond allows you to use the surety company to independently assess the operator's financial wherewithal and risk as Mr. Matthews noted previously. If a surety company issues a bond in the amount of $30 million, then there's no material risk that the operator will orphan any wells. And you should know that the operator can satisfy exacting financial criteria. If the operator is a public company, as proposed in the draft rules, then there's even more protection. For example, the operator's accounting records will disclose its asset retirement obligations, subject to SEC regulations and market analysis. In addition, public companies must disclose extensive information about their financial health in SEC reports, including information about liquidity, assets, and liabilities, which provides additional publicly available information that's subject to analysis by the market, surety companies, and the agencies. And public companies tend to be larger and operate more wells, which minimizes the risk that such wells will be orphaned according to the IOGCC report, which you heard testimony about last month. The comprehensive bond will reduce the administrative and bookkeeping burden associated with the financial assurance process, particularly for larger operators who drill and plug wells on a weekly or daily basis. Next slide, please. The amount of $30 million is precedent setting and is effectively much greater than the comparable amounts in Alaska and California. In Alaska, BLM found that it cost the agency $67 million to plug 30 legacy wells during the period from 2015 to 2020. This is about $2.2 million per well, or more than 20 times more than the plugging and reclamation costs estimated by the staff here in Colorado. This makes sense because Alaska has more remote areas, larger distances, colder weather, and shorter work seasons. So the comprehensive bond proposed in the draft rules will cover about 20 times more plugging work than the Alaska bond. In California, the nominal bond amount for more operators with more than 10,000 wells is $3 million. The state can require up to $30 million more in exceptional circumstances based on the particular risk posed by an operator. So the comprehensive bond in the draft rules is about 10 times larger than the nominal California bond. We are asking for one change to the option six process for comprehensive bonds, similar to the, the two trader organizations that you've heard from previously. The draft rules require the operator to obtain commissioner approval for the comprehensive bond, which is what is required for the riskiest operators in options three and four. We urge instead that the director issue this approval as she does for operate, uh, operators in options one and two who present a comparable lack of risk. There should be little need for fact finding or inquiry by the commissioners as the surety bond will speak for itself and various disclosures and information will be available for public companies. I also wanna dispel any concern you may have that a comprehensive bond would eliminate the incentive for operators to place idle wells out of service and plug them. 
The three companies strongly support the comprehensive bond, and they also plan to place thousands of wells out of service. This is consistent with their conduct over the past five years when the companies collectively plugged about 7,500 wells but didn't bother to adjust their bonding amount. Oxy's director, uh, asset director, Beth, Beth Bosworth, testified last month that Oxy did this work to eliminate less productive vertical wells, decrease costs, and reduce their well inventory, all of which would be unaffected by a comprehensive bond. Next slide. Finally, the present orphan well program has been historically were underfunded, receiving between uh, or receiving about a half a million dollars annually before 2018, and then approximately four to five million dollars annually thereafter. In part because of these funding limits, the program has operated at a relatively slow pace, at least until the last two years. Under the draft rules, the Orphan Well Program would receive about $10 million annually from the industry registration fee and another $10 million to $14 million annually in federal funds. This is a 400 to 500 percent funding increase, which should be sufficient to plug and reclaim about 250 orphan wells a year. After two years, the agency should be in a better position to assess funding needs and adjust the fee as needed. But at the outset, this should provide a substantial backstop for the financial assurance program. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Lepore now to discuss several changes to the draft rules. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, I wanna add my thanks to your thoughtful engagement and consideration uh, of, these, of these financial assurance rules over the past many months uh, and the same to Director Murphy and her staff. Um, I want to cover uh, first here five fairly specific um, and, and somewhat um, detailed uh, proposed changes to the February 11 draft rule. Um, those, those include that we would like to see some necessary off ramps added to the single well financial assurance for transferred wells uh, to ensure that beneficial transfers are not stifled. You have heard a similar theme from the prior two presenters. Uh, we are going to propose that you provide the director with authority to designate wells inactive if they produce less than one BOE or one MCF for more than 12 consecutive months, but return the definition of inactive well to a well that has no production. Again, you've heard this from others, uh, but it is a, a, an important uh, issue and one which we've been back and forth on a few times now. Um, we want to discuss the uh, orphan well funding mechanism as well. Uh, we largely agree with API's approach, but I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, we disagree that COGCC should wade into CDPHE's jurisdiction over air emissions, and we would ask that you not add the LDAR reporting requirements. And then we have some clarifications around the surface owner bond uh, changes that we would like to raise with you. So first, uh, I thought Mr. Matthews uh, was very articulate about the issue around single well financial assurance for all wells upon transfer. There are many transfers of wells that are largely beneficial. As he pointed out, these are transfers that can go from a, a lower uh, tier operator in the, in the current structure, an option three or four operator, up to an operator in a higher tier who presumably has a more robust portfolio uh, and can manage those wells effectively within their portfolio. Uh, he provided you some statistics that demonstrate that not all transfers of assets are down market transfers. Um, so without belaboring that point, we would like to see three off ramps. One is already there, that is the acreage swap. We would propose that if wells are transferred to either an option one or option two operator, that there be no requirement for single well financial assurance on those wells, rather those wells are absorbed into that operator's portfolio under that um, option and under their blanket bonding um, circumstances. Uh, and we think the same uh, effect should apply to option six operators. That appears to be the intent of the February 11 draft rules, um, but we'd like to see that a little bit more specific and a little bit uh, more clearly articulated for option six that when they acquire 
wells in a transfer, those are not subject to single well financial assurance either. Uh, turning to the definition of inactive well, and then the related rule 434C2B, uh, let me start with that 434C2B, which was added in the December, uh, uh, sorry, in the February draft uh, to allow the director to designate a well as inactive. Um, and at the same time, you have inactive being a well that has some amount of production. We think an elegant solution would be to return the inactive well definition to a well that has no production. Um, operationally, uh, that is the cleanest um, because wells that actually produce something um, have requirements around them operationally that are different than wells that have no production. So we think cleaner is to keep it uh, no producing and then give the director the ability to designate a well that produces less than one BOE or one MCF as inactive. That takes care of your puffer problem. That, that, allow, that will prevent wells from lingering uh, and avoiding that inactive status when they have that very low production uh, that currently is embedded in the inactive well draft. Um, I hope that's clear. And we've got a red line here to let you look at for a minute or two to, to see what that looks like. So here would be the new definition, which was actually the old definition. And then we changed 434 C2B uh, to make clear that the director could make that designation. Let me turn now to the uh, annual registration fee. Um, as Mr. Martin articulated, Oxy, Chevron, and Noble strongly believe that the best alternative, the most fair alternative, the alternative that we have advocated for from the very beginning of this rulemaking is a simple, not to exceed $200 fee on every well bore in the state. This ties the fee to the actual risk, the thing that is at risk, which is a well bore of being orphaned. That is the closest tie of any of these potential mechanisms. And for that reason alone, we think it is the best uh, outcome. Um, a production fee is incredibly disproportionate and um, unfair to larger operators. It starts to look an awful lot like a tax and not a fee. It, it would not be proportional to the liability that is at stake. Uh, larger operators would, be, would pay far more than their potential liability for orphan wells. So it's inequitable in that way. Total measured depth is irrelevant to plugging costs. You do not plug the lateral portion of a well. So what is subject to plugging and what drives cost is the vertical depth. Uh, total measured depth is also unfair to operators who are using the most efficient and the most advanced drilling technologies. Um, of the options that are in the February 11 draft rule, total vertical depth um, is perhaps the most equitable, but is also much more complicated than a simple annual well fee would be. For the simple reason that operators are gonna drill new wells and they're going to plug and abandon old wells. And every time they do that, you're gonna jigger up the, uh, the measured depth or the total vertical depth that the commission will have to calculate and that operators will have to calculate much more complicated than simply subtracting or adding the number of wells that are in the portfolio. Uh, we are interested um, in further discussion about Mr. Um, Martin's proposal from API uh, and we'll look forward to seeing what he has to say about that in, in greater detail. Turning now to what seems to be the hot topic du jour, um, I'm gonna, I, I certainly echo what Mr. Polkleser, Mr. Martin and Mr. Paulus said, they are all more expert in LDAR issues and air pollution control division regulations than I am. Um, so I'll take a slightly different approach. And that is first to remind you all that all of the inactive wells and the low producing wells that we're talking about are already subject to your rules and CDPHE rules. Moving them onto the out of service list changes nothing. It just 
puts them in a different bucket. It doesn't change their status. It doesn't change how they're being uh, managed. It doesn't change how they're being monitored. It doesn't change how the reporting requirements fall out on those wells. You're just putting them into a different bucket where they have the benefit of being on a defined timeline uh, for plugging and abandonment. Maybe I'll take this minute to um, uh, anticipate Commissioner McGowan's question about some milestones built into the rule. Um, there were milestones built into the rule in its original iteration and in the October draft. So if you go back to the October draft, Commissioner, you will see that there's a, a by the end of, I think, the second year that you put um, wells on that list, it may be the first year, you have to meet some of those milestones. Those milestones were pulled out in the December draft where it flipped to a director's discretion about milestones. And then in the most recent draft, um, it's just part of the reporting requirement. So certainly, you know, philosophically, we can see the, you know, the potential for milestones built into the rule if, you know, if that settles out with everyone. Um, the other thing I want to say here is that the commission has previously grappled with its jurisdiction over air emissions and over gas leaks. And in particular, in the uh, well bore integrity, sorry, the flow line rulemaking, uh, which was completed in February of 2018, the commission adopted a new definition of a grade one gas leak and embedded requirements in rule 434D11 um, sorry, I'm sorry, about in rule 602 G3 and 602 H about an operator reporting those grade one gas leaks to the commission. So I was the director at that time. And I remember that the discussion was about very much the discussion you're having now. What is COGC's jurisdiction and authority over gas leaks compared to the CDPHEs? This is where you landed. This was a place that the commission felt comfortable. This kind of a gas leak should be reported to you. And the rest of the air emission world is left in the care of the CDPHE. Fundamentally, as you've heard from others, that is exactly where we think it should be. Um, I'm not gonna belabor this slide at all. You've heard it from others, but the punchline is simple. The punchline is that the CDPHE's LDAR requirements requires operators not just to find leaks, but to repair them, to repair them quickly. As I understand it, most of those leaks that they find are repaired on the spot by tightening a valve. And you've heard discussion about the other kinds and so forth, so I won't, I won't belabor that. Um, and then I wanna reiterate, I think, something that has been said previously, but uh, if you'll recall at the, the outset of this rulemaking a year ago, uh, then AAG Minor prepared a literature review about emissions from um, abandoned and plugged wells. And, and the upshot was that these are not wells that have high emissions. So again, I think Mr. Paulus asked the question of, of what is the issue, the, the problem the commission is trying to solve by thinking about bolting on some LDAR requirements onto out of service. I'd ask you to give that some thoughtful consideration. Um, and then there's always the unintended consequence of if, if the out of service program, you know, contains unexpected consequences or unburdensome requirements uh, that it loses uh, the efficacy that, that we think it will have and that I think we all want it to have. Um, just a couple of things for surface owner protection bonds uh, that were changed in the, in the last draft. Um, my reading of the rules does not make it explicit that the intent is for those requirements to apply prospectively. I think that's an important consideration for you. Uh, and, and we would advocate that they would apply prospectively only so that if uh, operators with existing surface blanket bonds and the locations that are bonded under those remain the same, but on a go forward basis, you would operate under the, under the revised rules. Consistent with that, we would like to suggest that there would be a blanket bond amount available to operators. Um, and the main purpose there is administrative ease so that operators don't have to come up with a individual 
$10,000 bond for every single well that might be part of, of, a, of a location um, on which the operator bonds on. Um, I feel compelled to say we bonding on has always been strongly discouraged, certainly was during my tenure, certainly is now. It is not done very often. But that said, sort of the, the running to the bank, as it were, to get a single $10,000 bond every time that that might happen doesn't seem to make sense. And a large blanket bond of some size would, would uh, satisfy that. I'd like to turn now to uh, the final topic we'd like to touch on, um, and that is um, single well financial assurance for new wells. Quite obviously, this is really the pivotal um, policy decision facing the commission at this point. Um, we uh, were very pleased to see that in the most recent draft rules, the direction um, that a majority of the commission seems to be headed is for single well financial assurance on transfers rather than new wells. So let me take a minute to, to say some things that to some extent you've heard before, but I think uh, bear repeating. Um, we feel strongly that single well financial assurance for all new wells is neither necessary or reasonable. Uh, the claim that some stakeholders have made that Colorado faces an $8 billion orphan well problem assumes that every single active well in the state will become orphaned. That is patently absurd, and it is predicated on nothing more than conjecture, speculation, and hyperbole. The facts tell a very different story, a positive story for Colorado. And as we have done throughout this rulemaking, we would ask that your policy making decisions focus on the facts. The facts include these. 47,000 wells have been plugged in the state of Colorado. Uh, according to Director Murphy in her recent presentation, that represents very close to one half of all the wells that have ever been drilled. Over the last four years, the active well count has fallen in Colorado because operators are plugging more wells than they are drilling. Um, operators have plugged just in the past four years over 7,000 wells, an average of about 1,800 wells every single year at a capital expenditure of nearly $200 million if you assume that it costs $100,000 to plug, abandon, and reclaim a well. Next, orphan wells are rare. Um, Director Murphy tagged that number at less than 1,000. We think the number is really closer to 600. Do we think that is all of the orphan wells out there? Probably not. We agree that there are, that there will be some orphan wells revealed through this process. It will still be a very small percentage of the wells that have been drilled. As to new wells themselves, they are not orphan well risks. Nobody abandons and orphans a new well. I understand the logic that someday that well will be laid to rest. Uh, and it's good to know that the operator who owns the well at that time has single well financial assurance for it. That will happen through the transfer process. The bonding up of transfers will see that that happens along with the tier structure, the option structure that you have in place now. The facts are, that most orphan wells were producing less than two BOE when they were orphaned, and that most orphan wells come from operators who operate 10 or fewer wells. The next point about single well financial assurance that I don't think we can repeat too often, um, it would sideline an enormous amount of capital, an enormous amount of capital. So here are some statistics that were pretty easy to get our hands on. Um, there were 2,556 wells spud in 2019 and 2020. If that was all required $100,000 in financial assurance, you would have quarter billion dollars taken out of circulation, not available for operators to plug and abandon wells, not available for operators to hire staff, not available for operators to conduct environmental surveys and all of the other obligations they face. There are currently 3,100 approved form twos. If all of those have $100,000 single well financial assurance tag on them, you have more than a quarter billion dollars. PDC has recently submitted to you a cap application. You have encouraged caps as, a, as an efficient way for development to occur. $100,000 single well financial assurance for all of those new wells would add a $44 million 
$44.6 million price tag to that project. And very similarly for Noble's CDPs, their comprehensive development plan wells. And now I wanna just say a little bit about Dave's and my three clients, as Dave pointed out, three of the largest operators in the state. Um, uh, as you can see from the slide, collectively, they have plugged 6,800 wells in the past five years. That's 1,300 per year average between the three companies. That equates to 136,000, sorry, $136 million expenditure to plug and abandon and reclaim the wells by those three companies. I honestly find it sad. I'll say it again. I think it's sad that some stakeholders want to characterize this as filling to drill, that they want to disparage the efforts by these companies and any company to meet their obligations. To, sim to set the record straight, it is simply not the case that all of the wells these companies are plugging are being plugged because they are being replaced by horizontal wells. The fact is that the majority of them are plugged because they are at the end of their useful lives. To me, the real point is, regardless of why they were plugged, they were plugged. The companies did not sell these wells down market. They could have. They had offers to do so. Nor did they let them languish in idle well purgatory forever. Instead, they plugged them. There are 6,800 wells plugged and abandoned that will never be forfeited. The companies will designate thousands of additional wells to be plugged and abandoned under the out-of-service process um, if the out-of-service process is adopted largely as it appears in the February 11th draft. To conclude, as Dave and others have said, the regulatory regime laid out in the February 11th rules represents a giant leap forward for financial assurance in Colorado. The rules will provide the commission with a basket of tools to more closely monitor operators' financial assurance risk and adjust their financial assurance in response to that risk. It will require more financial assurance from operators with lower producing portfolios. It will ensure that when wells are transferred, the financial health of the operator acquiring those wells is accounted for. After a good bit of groping around, the commission has landed on a regulatory regime that reasonably addresses the size and scope of the orphan well risk in Colorado. Thank you for your time and we welcome your questions. Both for the presentation, uh, appreciate uh, the time and the thoughts uh, that have been provided to us. Um, I'll start off, I don't have a ton of questions, but did have a couple. Um, you noted that you appreciated the thoughts about the API concept of the orphan well fee. Do you want to elaborate on that at all, um, having heard it this morning? I, I would like to, Commissioner Chairman. I, I don't have the details, and, and if I missed them along the way, I apologize. Uh, this morning was the first that I had heard about that idea that option three and four operators might pay a different uh, amount. Um, yeah, just that the... Uh, one, two, and six would pay the 200 and three and four would pay something less, not knowing what that something less is. Um, hadn't really thought through option five. I'm just, you know, trying to get some initial thoughts perspective on, on the concept because I do like the simplicity. I think simplicity is good. Um, I tend to agree with the points you made about the other methods not being as fair. Um, but I, you know, we would need to sort of round that out and have fees for everyone. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, I, I, I agree with all you've said. It does um, have the, the beauty, the benefit of simplicity. Uh, it seems like if some operators are not putting in 100, uh, sorry, 200, then the other operators might pick up that slack. But that also seems to me something that is within the realm of, you know, negotiation and could be worked out. Okay. You also spoke to the efficacy of the OOS program if the LDAR requirements are lumped into it. Can you give some perspective of the percentage of less efficacy that would exist there from your clients? 
Um, I don't think I can, to be honest, Chair. Um, again, we don't really know where this is where this is headed or where it's going to land. Uh, I, I certainly understand some of the questions uh, from commissioners. It's it's just a report. You're already reporting it. It's not a burden. Um, Sometimes things seem simple on the surface and trigger un unintended consequences. So um, I don't. I, I'm. I'm. Can just keep babbling, or I can stop and ask Dave if he has anything further to say. But um, I think without knowing the details, it's hard to predict. You know what effect it would have on operators who would otherwise take advantage of the out of service. Yeah, I think. I think they're all. I think all of our clients are concerned about the efficacy of the out of service program. Um, it's a program they would like to use. Uh, I think it's a program that, that as we've talked about, has, has enormous um, potential benefits, um, really for, for all sectors. Um, I, you know, I, I could repeat some of the testimony that was provided by Mr. Polis and Mr. Martin and Mr. Colclasure earlier, they're much more experienced with, with LDAR and APCD than I am. Um, but again, these are, these are wells that currently exist. These are not new wells. There's not a change in the status quo. They, as part of being out of service, they will be shut in. Um, you know, Commissioner McGowan, you, you ask about um, milestones for, for decommissioning the wells. And I think Mr. Lepore's responded accurately that that's, that's something that prior drafts included and that we have supported. And in fact, I, I well, Mr. Lepore was speaking, I double checked our response uh, statement included a red line where we proposed adding those back in. And that would involve um, terminating electric service, purging piping tanks, vessels, and other surface equipment, and applying USLAT by December 31st of the second year after a well is placed out of service. We think that's a better approach to this issue than, than trying to borrow from or pick and choose from APCD's Reg 7 program, which is 400 pages long and is extremely comprehensive and complex. Mr. McGowan, would you like to follow up? I've treaded into your territory. No, I think you're doing well. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Lepore, you advocated um, with numbers the impacts of single well financial assurance for all new wells. Um, are your clients comfortable that if a new well was to be transferred, then the single well financial assurance would bind into that? Or is your client's perspective that the off ramps that you spoke of at the beginning of your thing would be applicable there? So acreage swaps, wells transferred to one or two, et cetera. Could you amplify on that? Yeah, thanks for the question, Chairman. Um, I, we are advocating that single well financial assurance apply to wells transferred from one operator to the next with the off ramps that we defined. So if a new well, whatever new min, means in this context is being transferred, it would depend on who the acquiring operator is, how the financial assurance would be handled, um, but it would be handled the same as a not new well, if I may, um, you know, under that structure. Thank you, that um, wanted to try to get some perspective on that. Okay, other commissioners with questions? Commissioner Nanjapa and then Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for um, coming before us today. Um, you mentioned the surface owner protection, protection bonds, um, that there should be a blanket bond, a statewide blanket bond available, but you didn't indicate an amount. Did you have any ranges that you would entertain? Um, Sure, Commissioner, I, I could come up with ranges. Um, you know, what, sure you uh, <laughs> what um, I, I think my understanding is that Commissioner Gonzalez was the advocate for, for the changes that were uh, appeared in the February 11th draft. 
And what was hap what happened there was that the single well financial assurance uh, amounts were doubled. So that's a starting place. You could double the blanket bond amount. Um, I don't think it would be patently unreasonable to reach a little higher uh, on the understanding that if it's 10,000 for every well and you're drilling a multiple well pad, and it's not so much about the $10,000 amount, uh, and that is certainly the case for, for Dave's and my clients, uh, but it's about the administrative efficiency and just not wanting to repeatedly get a, a new $10,000 bond. Maybe that number looks something like, you know, a, a low, a low six-figure number. Okay. Um, and then when you were saying also with that, with the, the surface owner bonds, so the existing surface owner protection bonds, you're saying should just be grandfathered in? I think so. Yes, Commissioner. I mean, it. Uh, if you think about it, it, it creates a, a funny, um, I don't know what the right word is, a, a wormhole or something uh, in the structure. So what you have now are a number, potentially uh, an operator has a $25,000 blanket bond um, and over time has bonded on to one or more locations would have one or more wells and all of those fit within that $25,000 bond. So if you don't apply this prospectively, do they have to go back and bond up at $10,000 each for whatever wells are currently covered by $25,000? That is typically not the way that this commission has introduced new rules. New rules are almost always prospective. Um, and we think that would be the better outcome here. Um, and then the, the sort of the next question is, if you have a $25,000 blanket bond today that covers a certain number of locations and wells, um, and you added um, a, a new larger blanket bond, does that take effect the next time an operator bonds on? Or does the, does the operator have to upgrade their existing bond from 25,000 to 100,000. So we, we sort of tried to avoid proposing solutions for that um, as more than just flag the issue. So, because it doesn't, it doesn't appear to us that, that all of those things were thought through and, and sort of embedded in the rules or not, or clarified in the rules or not. Okay. And so I guess um, if there was, a blanket bond that was introduced and let's say it was $200,000, um, then would it not be appropriate to ask for, I, my understanding is, and maybe I should back up, is that, um, you know, these, I believe that most operators hold the statewide bond and maybe there's some, you know, smaller operators that have per well bonds, but I think generally speaking, um, with most of our bonds that had a statewide option, you know, that's what was chosen. Um, so would it not be unreasonable to require the new amount in the statewide blanket um, for those who chose that path? I, I am going to default to the fact that that is not typically what the commission has done. Typically the commission has said, starting when these rules take effect, these are the new requirements. And if an operator came forward after these rules took effect and said, I need to bond onto this location, it has a lot of wells and I want a statewide blanket bond, at that point, that bond would cost $100,000 uh, or whatever the number is. Um, another way to do it would be to say, I have a statewide blanket bond. It's the old bond, it's $25,000. I need to add some new wells to it. So I'm going to upgrade that bond to the new amount. Um, so in other words, they would be, any operator that had this, the surface owner protection bonds would be grandfathered in unless they acquired new wells or their portfolio to use in some way. That's how I would think of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you both for your presentation and your thoughts. A um, couple of questions. I mean, <clears throat> this is 
not one that I really want to talk about, but I, I do want to point out um, that the entire financial assurance rules that we're talking about here are retrospective and not prospective, generally speaking. So I'm not sure why we would treat surface owner bonds any differently than we are with any other bonding considerations that we've got that are being discussed in this rulemaking. So, I mean, I give you a chance to comment on that, but it's not, you know, it's not making sense to me why we would treat one differently. I, 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 Commissioner Messner, I guess I'd like the opportunity to give that more thought myself, but is the intent, and, and this is why we raised the question, it is the intent that for every operator that currently has a $5,000 bond for the surface owner, they need to go back and increase that to $10,000. I mean, if you're asking me that question, that's the way that I read the rule as written, because that's what we're asking everyone that has a well in Colorado to do as we look at potentially revising financial assurance requirements. And so, again, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this one because it's not it's not one of my topics that I'm particularly concerned about. But I'm just finding it a little I mean, I think we should be equitable in how we apply these financial assurance rules prospectively or retrospectively. So. Um, <clears throat> I do want to talk, however, about comprehensive bonds. Um, and so I've been given this one a lot of thought and, uh, I think, I think a couple of things. And so I want to get your perspective on a couple of things. One is, I mean, understanding that the rules now allow for consolidation of subsidiaries under a parent company for reasons of financial assurance, which it seems like, although I have no idea for sure that your companies may choose to do that or may not choose to do that, I don't know. But should that happen, we're talking about potentially significantly more wells under one financial assurance umbrella than if we looked at all these operators including the subsidiaries independently. Um, I mean, is that fair to say? I, I don't know that that's accurate it, with respect to our companies, Commissioner. Okay, I, I, I think I'd be of, curious to hear I, I think of Oxy, you know, for example, having, I think it's 4,000 wells today and, and Noble having roughly 4,000 wells today and PDC having, I don't know, 2,500 to 3,000 wells today and, and not having that further divided into um, other or different ent entities. So I think that's, that's what we've been looking at the comprehensive bond as, as so a you, you don't anticipate that your clients would utilize the ability to consolidate subsidiaries under a parent company for financial assurance considerations? Because I, I, my question is, is, if this is not actually gonna be utilized, then I'm wondering what the value of this consolidation rule would be. Um, well, I, and so I, I guess I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on that. Commissioner, I, I, I think companies may choose to consolidate different entities for a variety of business purposes, right? For, for corporate governments or risk or any number of, of other reasons may lead them to make organizational changes um, that might include consolidation. Um, so I, I can't, I can't, and I don't believe there's a consolidation piece that's, that's specific to the comprehensive bond proposal. And maybe maybe the general consolidation language um, would would be applicable. And I'll I'll be honest with you, I haven't given a, a great deal of thought to how it would apply um, to option six. So, what we're proposing here is a one size fits all comprehensive bond, right? And so it's a flat fee. It's a thirty million dollar fee. Or that's what's being contemplated in the rules right now. It's not. It's not what I suggested, but um, um, but I, I see some 
equity issues in the utilization of the comprehensive bond as we look at um, the different operators that may choose to use a comprehensive bond. So for me, the idea of a comprehensive bond is to develop an option of simplicity for operators to not have to do the, the administration to sort out blanket bonding versus inactive well bonds and transfer of assets bonds. <clears throat> um, however, if you've got an operator that is operating 2000 wells and 35% of those are inactive and they choose to do a $30 million, I'm making numbers up here, and they choose to do a, a comprehensive bond of 30 million versus someone who has a consolidated operator who has 7,500 wells, who has 30%, 35% of the wells inactive, you've got, and you're still at $30 million, you've got a big discrepancy on what that comprehensive bond actually covers and really takes away from the overall elegance of the option structure and the blanket bonding structure as, as, as contemplated in this, in this piece. And so I'm guessing, I'm wondering, understanding that you could have an operator with 2000 wells and an operator with 7,500 wells, both interested in a comprehensive bond because they're looking for the simplicity of that. Why would it not be an option to utilize the bespoke approach to look at an operator's portfolio, to look at their inactive well count, to look at their transfer count, to look at their blanket bonding level and come up with a reasonable comprehensive bond that would allow that operator to utilize the simplicity of administrating uh, a comprehensive bond, but at different levels, depending on what that operator's portfolio actually is. Why have this flat fee? Um, a couple of reasons, Commissioner. I, I do think, um, and I may just disagree with you, but I think it is a simple, administratively simple solution that avoids the need for continual bookkeeping, tracking, and adjustments, particularly for larger operators who may be drilling and plugging wells weekly or daily. And I think there is a significant benefit to that. I think there is a benefit to the, to the commission um, by virtue of the fact that if an operator can obtain a $30 million comprehensive bond, then you have independent validation by the surety who has done its own independent underwriting and has applied exacting financial standards for that purpose. As you heard Mr. Matthews discuss this morning and his witness testify about last month, there's independent validation from the commission. You don't need to uh, direct your staff to be reviewing financial statements or financial information to try to make these, these, these same type of determination or add new staff for that purpose. So I, I think there are benefits there. I, and, and, and then I guess the third, the third issue I would raise is, um, it's not clear to me that the bespoke option works very well. That, that it's not clear to me what the standard for the bespoke option is. If the standard is uh, undue hardship, it's not clear to me how that operates or applies in this instance. You've spoke eloquently in prior hearings about how you might apply that, but you're one of, one of five commissioners. Um, I don't think uh, undue hardship is a particularly applicable standard for, for what we're talking about here. So I have all of those concerns. I think it is a good option. Um, you know, for, for what it's worth, uh, if, if the companies place some significant numbers of wells out of service um, and with the current option criteria that are in the draft rules, it, it, they, they could qualify as an option one operator. They would all qualify as option one operators. Their, their bonds would be much less than $30 million as such. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's particularly an accurate statement um, because you've got potentially 
<clears throat> I mean, it, it does it does matter how many wells they put on the OOS list. I mean, I, I don't discount that at all. But even yeah. if an operator that has <clears throat> 6,500 6, wells that has 3,000 wells on the that are inactive, and even if they put 2,000 wells on the out of service list, they still have a thousand wells that would have to be um, that would have to be uh, single well financial assurance under the tier uh, the option one structure, right? So uh, if you do that math, it's even at fifty thousand per well, that's fifty million dollars, right? And so I'm 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 just. My point here is, is that I don't know that, that one size fits all in a comprehensive bond. I take your point with the undue hardship very well as far as being able to qualify for a, um, you know, a bespoke approach and that perhaps something like suggested by Mr. Matthews may be a more appropriate criteria for the presumption of um, the option structure that you would have to start at or would at least make a showing why you would have to or why you would want to do something different but i i think there's some challenges around having a, a flat comprehensive bond versus looking at this from 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 different levels right a different 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 operator portfolios understanding what the intent of the comprehensive bond is and still embracing the intent but not necessarily giving a significant discount, right? But, but Commissioner, I, I guess I just disagree with you. Um, I think the intent here is simplicity and administrative ease, and, and we've talked about that. Um, and then I think the intent is a simpler process, that's, that's for the operator, simpler process for the commission too. And so if you have a surety issuing a, a bond in an amount of $30 million, that surety has done the underwriting for you. That surety has reviewed the operator's books and financial wherewithal for you and has determined applying exacting financial criteria that, that there is, uh, that, 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 that they're willing to, to provide the $30 million in fund. That's, I think they're doing your work for you. Um, I, and, and the, the fact is these commissioner, the, these operators, which are, if not the biggest, some of the biggest operators in the state, we're not talking about 6,000 wells. We're talking about three to 4,000 wells. And if they utilize the out of service process, as they would like to do if the out of service rule remains as it is in the draft rules, um, then we're talking about many fewer wells, right? Because when you put up well out of service, you're kind of taking it away from the financial assurance calculations. Yeah, I'll just add a tiny bit to that. Um, all, all three of our clients have run the numbers, Commissioner, on you know what they think they will put in out of service and what that will leave on their portfolios in inactive or low producing. Um, and the thirty million dollar comprehensive bond would be substantially greater than what they would be obliged to uh, pay under Tier One. Um, it is very much about the administrative uh, expediency for them, um, and going through. Option five obviously requires a hearing. Maybe that's not super onerous. Um, it's not something that, that most operators want to voluntarily sign up for. Um, and then last, last, last point is that there is, there is some check and balance um, in the system with the direct review of the financial assurance plans. Um, and I, and you know, again, I, I fully agree with Dave. If you have a surety uh, provider willing to write a $30 million bond, it seems to me like a pretty strong indicator that you've got a, a healthy um, uh, company. Um, but if the director looked at it and thought otherwise, I think she has the opportunity to say, I, I don't think option six is, is the way to go for you. And she might then at that point direct them to um, option five. Well, I appreciate that you have your points of view. Um, and I, uh, I'm not sure I'm there 
Uh, I'm still, I mean, again, I'm not opposed to the comprehensive bond concept. I think that it's the, the, it's the flat fee that's given me heartburn um, versus being a little more pragmatic in its utilization. And I think that the bespoke approach could be a potentially good option for that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I appreciate you guys considering to uh, considering continuing to think about these things. And so uh, again, appreciate your testimony today. So thank you. Thank you and likewise. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Commissioner Mesner. I was, had some, of, some similar questions. Along the same lines, I think what I've been trying to um, noodle around is the, the comprehensive bond, kind of the incent, the, the benefit of the comprehensive bond is all these different layers then don't apply, right? So upon transfer doesn't apply. Number of inactive wells and having to make a decision doesn't apply. What I'm a little, I guess, worried about is that someone who has a comprehensive bond and a very high number of inactive wells could take advantage and keep those wells in inactive status because there is no, um, there's no stick, so to, so to speak, anymore that says if you have an inactive well for a certain amount of time, you have to make a decision. You either bond up, plug it, or put it back into production. And so I, I understand that you all are saying you're gonna take advantage of the out of service list, but I feel like there's this, this um, danger of this, this loop here that could happen where a large number of wells could stay in an active service, in active status and nothing happens to them because of the comprehensive bond where the, those rules would no longer apply. And so I, I was wondering um, whether or not a cap on number of an active well should apply similar to a tier one operator might have to apply so that we know that would not get taken advantage of and those wells would truly move into the out of service list. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that. A couple of, couple of thoughts, let me start off and then maybe Mr. Mr. Laporte has some additional thoughts. Um, you know, a, 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 a concern is if, if operators have to if, if an operator has a significant number of inactive wells, and then they have to track and do bookkeeping on inactive wells, then it seems to me the advantage of a comprehensive bond in terms of simplicity, administrative ease is being lost or diluted. Um, second, I don't think there's a mystery about who would, who would use a comprehensive bond at, at this time. I mean, our, our three clients, would, would certainly look at using a comprehensive bond. They've plugged, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're tired of hearing Matt and I discuss this. They've plugged thousands of wells uh, over the last five years. They're not parking wells. There's no history of them parking wells. The testimony that you received on this subject, the actual factual testimony was from Beth Bosworth of, uh, of Anadarko last month who talked about the reason that Anadarko has had an aggressive plugging program. And it involved the fact that, that the wells, the idle wells are not as productive, they're not as valuable. Um, they're uh, in, in some cases, uh, uh, they're, they're, there are costs associated with continuing to maintain them. Um, they are, they'd like to advance their, their well portfolio, move their well portfolio for, forward. None of those are contingent or related to having a comprehensive bond. Um, so I don't, I, I guess I don't see a, a problem that would be solved by adding an additional condition or requirement regarding percentage of, of inactive wells. And I don't know what that percentage would be. I mean, companies will continue to have some inactive wells for, for a variety of reasons. Um, the, the, uh, the commission's offset well policy that requires wells to be shut in uh, when other wells nearby are being drilled and fractured or long-term maintenance or holding a lease or a, a number of other reasons. So it's not something that we can get away from entirely. Right, but all the all the tier one operators and or option one and option two and option three and option four are in that same boat. They they're 
they're going to have wells that are going to be in inactive status for similar purposes, but are limited to the number they are allowed to have before they have to bond up. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I come back to I. I think it takes away from the advantages associated with the comprehensive bond if you've got to do bookkeeping on a particular class of wells. And I think um, companies, at least the, the companies who have been identified as likely to use the comprehensive bond have a strong track record of plugging wells uh, aggressively and not parking wells or leaving them in, in an active status. Um, another thought, what about the what about tracking inactive and ensuring that it doesn't remain static, that it's um, decreasing over time each year as we look annually at the financial assurance plan? Uh, Commissioner, you're suggesting it, would, would that be a reporting requirement? Reporting requirement might be a requir requirement as part of a comprehensive bond that you can't just leave your inactive wells and it's kind of static or growing that needs to be decreasing. Yeah, you know, one other thought that, that occurs to me um, is if, if an operator, let's say it's not our three, three companies, but there's a, another operator who wants to use a comprehensive bond. And, and the facts are, as you suggest, they've got a very large portfolio of, of inactive wells and they have no, no track record of plugging their inactive wells, and they've remained inactive for a long period of time, then I think as, as Mr. Lepore explained a few minutes ago, as part of the director's review, the director may decide that, that this doesn't look right, that there are, is a significant risk of that operator abusing the process and, and simply parking its inactive wells under a comprehensive bond and, and direct the operator to the bespoke option where you all could make a decision uh, about, uh, about that or add additional conditions for that purpose. I think the director's review would provide an additional check uh, to, to try to get at the, the concern you have. Questions for the panel. All right, uh, seeing no further questions, uh, thank you both for the presentation and for being with us this morning. We do appreciate it. Thank okay. you very much, commissioners. Okay, um, I believe we have arrived early to our lunch break. Our next panel will be approximately 45 minutes and then there will be questions. So probably more like an hour, an hour and a half. Um, I think we should take our break. Um, we had set aside about 35, 40 minutes for a break. What are folks thoughts? It's 11.51, come back at 12.30. All right, seeing thumbs up. We'll see everybody at 1230.